Okay, so the, uh, today I'm going to talk about you know, building dependable situation aware software, uh, and in particular talk about self-adaptation. Uh, and uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, outline. So I, I, I will start by discussing where, why the problem is there. Um, uh, talking about requirements and change. Uh, in particular, I will talk about the uh, situation today in which we are dealing with uh, what I call continuously running systems. So systems that never stop, you know, they uh, continue to evolve. They have to continuously evolve. Uh, and about the need for evolution and self-adaptation, uh, I think that I will have some uh, uh, hints to give you uh, on uh, what I learned, you know, after this, uh, these five years of uh, research about, you know, how one can engineer uh, self-adaptive systems and then I would like also to spend some time about you know things that I learned that I would like to do and I'm doing now uh, so look at the future uh, uh, and in particular uh, look at uh, the need I think for us to rethink uh, about uh, let's say the, the whole life cycle of software systems from uh, you know the initial design to their uh, operation uh, and kind of set up a possible research agenda. Uh, and let's see how far we go. Uh, so first of all, uh, revisiting uh, requirements and change. And here what I would like to do is to start by, uh, you know, presenting to you a, uh, a very uh, uh, illuminating piece of work that has been done uh, in the past uh, by uh, Michael Jackson and Pamela Zave, who I think you know, gave a very deep contribution on understanding requirements. Uh, so basically we are uh, uh, software engineers and the goal of, uh, of, uh, of software engineers is to build machines. Uh, of course the machines that we build are a little bit more abstract than this, uh, but so we build abstract machines. Uh, and, uh, but the point is that we build those machines because we need to do something, we need to uh, have an effect on the world. Uh, the world is where we find the goals for the machines that we build, the requirements that these machines have to satisfy. So we need not only to be able to build machines, but first of all, we have to be able to understand the goals and the requirements uh, for the machines that we build. Uh, and the machine, of course, uh, is able to uh, achieve these goals and satisfy those requirements because the machine can have an effect of the word through, you know, shared phenomena, sh phenomena that are shared between the machine and the word. And uh, so the machine can sense something from the word, can uh, uh, do something on the word. So there, if you want, there's uh, sensors in, in an abstract sense and actuators uh, that, you know, do things on the word. Uh, so in the end, uh, when we build systems, we have to come out with what we can call a specification for the machine, which basically talks about those shared phenomena. So the specification is a description of what uh, happens at the interface between the machine and the word. Of course, I'm talking about the specification for the machine. Uh, uh, to achieve uh, what the machine can achieve on the word through the shared phenomena, we have to ac take into account, however, uh, something that is very important, that is the properties of the word. So we can achieve something here which can satisfy certain goals and achieve certain requirements by the machine because we take into account when we design this machine some of these properties of the word. Okay, this is a very general picture uh, that holds for any software system that we build in a sense. So understanding the word is extremely important. Uh, any system that we build, in fact, interacts with the word. Any interesting system has some interaction with the word. And this is particularly true in the, in the, in the, in the case 
of, this, of many systems that we build today that are called cyber physical. Because in cyber physical systems, really the machine uh, interacts with the physical world, gets data uh, from uh, sensors that are in the environment and does something in the environment through actuators, as I said. Uh, so, but to build the machine for given goals and requirements, we have to make assumptions on the part of the world of interest that will be affected by the machine. This part of the world is what, you know, very often we call the domain, or the physical environment, very often, with which uh, the machine has to interact. Example, suppose that the goal for you is to move some kind of stationary body uh, in a certain direction to reach a certain point. I mean, that's a very simple example, of course. The solution, of course, is that the software has to send commands to some actuator uh, which applies a given force to the body. Why this solution can achieve this goal? Because we know the physical law of movement that governs the world. We know that a force that you apply to a body uh, moves the body in the chosen direction. So there's the physical laws that you take into account uh, to achieve the goals that you want in the real world through the software. So the word properties that we have to rely upon, uh, they are very important. Uh, of course, depending on the system, uh, these word properties may concern uh, the physical laws of motion, as I said before, you know, in the, kind of, in, in the case of mechanical systems like uh, autonomic trains, for example. Uh, uh, they have to deal with network latency if uh, uh, the system that you're building is a kind of system that use remote uh, uh, servers, for example. It may depend on usage profiles that you have to take into account when you design your system because you want to offer some kind of uh, 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 um, uh, usable uh, interface to your user. It may depend on remote servers response time, on sensors, actuators behavior. Uh, in general, you know, we may say as, uh, you know, Michael Jackson and Pamela Zay is that those word properties, they bridge the gap between the requirements, what you want to achieve in the real world, and the specifications, what the machine does. So to bridge the, grab, the gap between the two, you have to take uh, those into account. Now, when we build systems, uh, we uh, try to convince ourselves uh, or convince others that the system that we build works. Okay? Again, how can we frame this uh, type of reasoning? Well, suppose that you have some kind of precise or formal description of the requirements, what I said before, what you want to achieve, in the real world, of the description, you have again, some kind of representation of the machine interface with the real world, what I called specification before. And suppose you have some kind of description of the properties of the, of the environment that <clears throat> you are assuming when you're designing your system, okay? Suppose you have all of this. What is your responsibility as a designer? Well, your responsibility is that, suppose that the machine that you build actually satisfies the specification. And suppose that the environment actually behaves according to the assumptions that you make. So suppose that S and E hold, then you have to prove this entailment. So this is an entailment relation. From this and this, you have to be able to convince yourself or convince somebody else that R, the requirements, are satisfied. Okay, that's a, uh, you know, a very abstract, if you want, view of what is the uh, uh, responsibility of a, uh, an engineer. Uh, the responsibility is to be able to design a system that behaves according to this, such that under given assumptions, you satisfy the requirements. Right? Do we agree on this? Okay, now, uh, Let's look more at the environment properties uh, that uh, you have to assume when you design your system. 
Actually, those properties you can divide into two broad categories, if you want. The laws of the environment and the assumptions. Uh, what are they? Well, the laws are, again, you know, I mean, basically using uh, you know, some of the concepts that Michael Jackson and Pamela Zay uh, describe in their work. So the laws are definitive statements about the problem word phenomena. So they are, for example, the, physic, the laws of physics. If you're dealing with a mechanical system, uh, the laws of mechanical motion. Okay, so they are law that hold regardless of any software to be, any software that you're going to develop. They hold, we know, you know, Newton told us that they hold, okay? So for example, you can assume that if the train acceleration in this time interval is greater than zero, then the train speed at T2 is greater than the train speed at T1. Okay, that's, that's a law of, uh, uh, it's a mechanical law, right? A law of movement. But what are the assumptions? Well, assumptions are, as the, the word says, they are statements that are to be satisfied by the environment that you assume they hold. And, then, uh, and I will elaborate more on what it means that you assume and why you assume. Uh, but that, those assumptions may be violated. So those are assumptions that you make maybe because you have imperfect knowledge, which is typical. Uh, in many cases, we are dealing with environments for which we have imperfect knowledge. Or you have a perfect knowledge at the time, but things change. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, the temperature is in the range minus 40 plus 40. Yes, but maybe there can be uh, anomalous uh, situations in which that is not true. Transmission delay is less than 10 milliseconds. Or max load uh, is X queries per second. So, for example, suppose that you are asked to design uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, e-commerce uh, 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 website for some kind of uh, uh, seller, okay? And you have to uh, uh, dimension your system in a way that you uh, 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 can show that you will provide some kind of, let's say, reasonable response time always, okay? Uh, where reasonable means that the delay will be less uh, than something. Uh, but of course, you know, to do this, uh, you make some assumptions like, you know, how many people, you know, can concurrently submit requests to my system to buy goods? Because uh, those assumptions are necessary for you to dimension your system so that you can show that those requirements are satisfied, right? Uh, but uh, how certain are you when you're making uh, assumptions of this kind? You know, very often they're based on your experience, they're based on uh, uh, common knowledge, they're based on rules of thumb. Uh, so this is why those assumptions that are always present in the systems that we design, they are there, but they can, buy, they, they can be violated. So that's a distinction between laws and assumptions. So, uh, uh, as I said, you know, assumptions capture properties that may be later disproven or challenged. They are intrinsically subject to uncertainty, very often due to partial knowledge that you have. Uh, but of course, at some point, they become known. Uh, they become known when the system normally, as the system is running, is active, so at runtime. And they may change also at runtime. They, they may behave in a certain way at a certain time point, and then they may change. So they are intrinsically subject to change, to possible change. So uh, if we are looking for a place where changes may occur, certainly one place is in those assumptions, 
that we make about the environment. Change in general. Well, change is endemic in software systems. I mean, if there is any other type of a human artifact where change is endemic, uh, that is software. So software is a place in which, you know, requirements change continuously and the environment change. Uh, in what follows, I will mostly focus on this, but this is also another extremely important source of change. So, you know, I, I'm assuming here, and I will assume in the rest of my presentation here, that requirements are stable. Uh, but because of what I said before, uh, 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 things may change in the environment. But of course, in, in general, here also, you have a lot of turbulence, let's say. Okay? Uh, as I said, you know, change is very often a manifestation of uncertainty. So the uncertainty that you have when you initially design your system leads to change, very often. Uh, uncertainty, of course, may refer to requirements. Requirements not well known up front become known as the system is given. Uh, environment assumptions that are certain, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and there is at least, you know, two examples again that I can give, you know. Uh, think of mobile systems in which you have context change, continuous, uh, due to mobility. Uh, think of user intensive systems in which the user profiles change continuously. So, the point is that those changes in the requirements, in the environment assumptions that you made, they cause evolution. They have to cause evolution of the machine. Why? Well, let's revisit uh, our, uh, uh, you know, fundamental equation here, uh, which says that, you know, we have to prove that uh, a given machine under given assumptions satisfy the requirements. I mean, suppose you have done this, but then, you know, s um, changes may occur here, may occur here. Wherever they occur, they may break this. So if you initially were able to prove that your machine, given the assumption, satisfied the requirement, uh, if the requirements change or the assumptions change, then this may be broken. Uh, so, in particular, I mean, if you take E and you split, you know, the assumptions into the changeable assumptions, the, uh, the assumptions, so the changeable part, and the unchangeable part, which is the lows, uh, you know, the, uh, the change, of course, uh, may occur here, but still, you know, the change that occurs in E uh, may break your uh, fundamental relation. So they break what I call the dependability argument that you have to be able to uh, 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 defend when you uh, uh, um, design a system. Uh, so the, the evolution, which is the change here, is the consequence of the fact that because of a change here, sorry, the change uh, in the machine, evolution, in the specification, okay? You have to change this because due to the fact that one of these changes, this relation is not satisfied anymore, okay? So the evolution, which is a change in the software, in the specification in this case, is a consequence of uh, 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 the changes, which is what I said, <coughs> okay? So, we can distinguish between, uh, as I said, you know, evolution and adaptation. So, evolution is the general case. Because of changes, uh, you have to evolve your, uh, your system. Uh, adaptation is a special case of evolution that is due to changes in the environment. Uh, and this is an increasingly, increasingly relevant phenomenon that is typical of cyber physical systems, user intensive systems. But another case that I haven't, uh, uh, um, haven't uh, cited uh, so far, uh, which is another thing that we have today, 
that we are developing systems on virtual infrastructures. We are developing systems for cloud infrastructures. Uh, we are developing systems that use service provided on the infrastructure by providers and we incorporate these in our system. So this means that the, uh, the infrastructure on which our system runs is volatile, it changes. So there is change in the infrastructure. And the infrastructure, I mean, in the general picture that I gave before, is part of the environment in which, on which you count when you run your software to achieve certain results in the real world. So a change in the infrastructure may, may uh, make it impossible for you with the given software that you have to satisfy the requirements. Think of a change in the service, but think also of a change in the performance, for example, of your cloud uh, 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 infrastructure, which may generate a, a degradation in the performance of your application that leads to some kind of violation of the requirements uh, for your end user. So, uh, now online versus offline evolution versus self-adaptive system. Well, you know, traditionally, uh, how do we manage change? Well, we manage change by, let's say, switching off the application. Well, let's say, design a new version of the application. At some point, install the new version, which means switch off the old system, install the new system, run it. Okay? So, traditionally, change is performed offline by engineers through some kind of maintenance activity. But more and more, uh, systems are required to be continuously running. So uh, this asks you know, for online evolution, that is applying changes to the machine as the system is running and providing service. So this change has to occur as the system is uh, uh, providing service. And the special case of self-adaptive systems is the case in which we have online adaptation but online ad adaptation is self-managed. So you don't even require uh, some kind of offline modification of the software that then can be dynamically installed in your system as the system is running. But uh, the, uh, th th this uh, you know, adaptation is uh, self-managed. Okay, so self-adaptive systems. So again, you know, uh, remember that we have this fundamental uh, 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 dependability argument. Uh, what should a self-adaptive system be able to do? Well, first of all, the system has to be able to detect changes. So the system has to be provided with a sensing or monitoring capability uh, that allows changes in the assumptions that you made about the environment to be captured. And then the system has to modify itself, S, uh, and of course the implementation, uh, to keep satisfying uh, this dependability argument. So to do this, I argue that there is a paradigm shift uh, in the way we conceive systems. Uh, and the paradigm shift involves both development time and runtime. Uh, in particular, the claim is that the traditional boundary between development time and runtime that we assume as fixed. So there is a point in which development ends and then the system is uh, installed and run. Okay, well this separation, the traditional separation that characterizes you know, the systems that we have seen so far, fades here. In particular, uh, the runtime environment has to be provided with the called reasoning and reacting capabilities. So the runtime environment has to be able to as I said, detect change, reason about the consequences of change, 
and react to change. So there is a change, I detect it. Once I detect the change, I can analyze what is the consequence of change. Is the consequence of change that my dependability argument is broken? Then I have to reconfigure myself, I have to react uh, to this change if I want to continue to provide service. This is the paradigm. But to do this, to do this, what happens is that models and verification can have to shift to also runtime. So as I said, the boundary between development time and runtime fades. In particular, these two things, uh, uh, model, uh, models and verification have to be there at runtime. And let's see why. To detect change, as I said, you have to monitor the environment. The changes that you detect have to be retrofitted to the model of the environment that you have. Uh, and by reasoning on this model, okay, uh, you have to check whether the dependability argument is satisfied or broken. So the updated models must be satisfied to check for violations. And in the case of violation, you have to do self-adaptation. So to support this, uh, uh, you know, all this story, you need to have a model at runtime. You have to be able to update the models at runtime uh, to capture the changes that you detect. And you have to continuously verify at runtime whether the model continues to satisfy, uh, uh, whether the system modeled in this way continues to satisfy the requirements. And if not, you have to trigger uh, the self-adaptation. So in a sense, again, this is a picture. So we have goals and requirements, and we have the environment. Uh, we build some kind of model of the environment of the machine and the, and the machine uh, and through some kind of model driven implementation we have uh, you know our uh, running system uh, they, uh, and this is what happens at development time at runtime what happens is that you know you execute your system in the real world you monitor what happens in the real world if necessary by reasoning on what you monitor, you change the model here. And if the goals or the requirements are not satisfied anymore, you do a self-adaptation. So you have this continuous change that is in place uh, in, uh, in the system. Now I'll, I zoom in into, that was a kind of, let's say, general view of what goes on. Uh, and let me be more precise uh, and I take one simple uh, case study, if you want, into consideration. Suppose that I'm building a system which integrates external services and the system interacts with users. Like, you know, I will give you an example sh shortly. But let's say this is a general category of systems that I'm focusing on, okay? Uh, and I focus on non-functional requirements that I want to achieve, like reliability, performance, energy consumption, cost. So I'm, 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 I'm focusing on requirements of this kind. And these are requirements that I can, you know, state uh, in a quantitative way in probabilistic terms, as we will see. So I will use some kind of probabilistic uh, uh, description uh, to uh, uh, describe my requirements. Um, so, the uh, uh, domain assumptions can be broken into two parts. Uh, the domain assumptions that are subject to change uh, are domain assumptions that may uh, 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 concern the way the user interacts with the system. So, the user profile here can change. I have to make some assumptions, but they may change. So, this is one source of possible uncertainty, change, that I have to be able to tolerate and adapt to. The other is here. My system that I build integrates a number of external services. But these services may change 
independently because you know I'm buying a service from some service provider and the service provider may change uh, the service without telling me so here there is also uncertainty on this part of the system so I have to make some assumptions that may be broken and my system has to adapt to those so what kind of models can I choose well first of all uh, you know, I talk about models, we, very often we need more than one model of the system and we need to keep more than one model at runtime of the system depending on the type of properties that we manage uh, through the model. As I said, you know, I'm focusing on non-functional properties uh, uh, which uh, allow us to reason about uncertainty. Uh, so in particular, in the example I show here, I will uh, use uh, some Markov model uh, to describe uh, my system. Okay, basically uh, I will use uh, discrete time Markov chains and if you are not familiar with discrete time Markov chains think of state machines, a label transition system where transitions are described by some kind of probability distribution. So I can say what is the probability that from a given state I go into this state or that state or that state. Uh, I can also associate weights, uh, you know, positive functions or rewards with states and or transitions to model things like cost, you know, the cost involved in doing something, okay, uh, which may be used to model, for example, energy consumption, how much I pay in terms of energy consumption to do some kind of operation or, you know, how much I pay uh, to do that. So. Briefly, uh, what kind of properties can we check on models of this kind? Uh, well, the properties uh, are the things that sp specify the requirements that we want to show that the system that satisfies that model, that behaves according to that model, actually uh, uh, satisfies. So the properties that the system satisfies uh, are the requirements uh, for uh, uh, the system that we are going to build. And, uh, uh, and in particular here, I will focus on properties of interest that I can express in some kind of notation, formal language, typically using some kind of temporal logic. And, and then, you know, uh, I will uh, use model checking uh, to prove that the model satisfies the properties of interest that I express using this language. And this can be done mechanically. So for a discrete time Markov chains, uh, the properties can be written in a language that is called PCTL, which stands for probabilistic CTL, probabilistic continuous time uh, logic. Uh, um, and uh, um, which basically allow you to state Properties like what is the probability, well that's not a property, to express things like what is the probability of eventually reaching a given state. So for example this may be a failure state of my system and I want to be able to show that the probability of reaching a failure state is lower than a certain threshold. And I want to be able to do this by reasoning on my model. Or uh, I, I and of course I can state the property that says that the probability of eventually reaching a given state is less than some threshold. Or I can uh, predicate on the total reward that is accumulated, accumulated while reaching a certain state from a given state. So for example, uh, what is the total uh, energy consumption involved in a given transaction? You know, for example, just you know, as a side remark, you know, speaking about, for example, energy consumption is becoming a relevant uh, 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 kind of property, especially thinking of mobile devices or uh, 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 sensors or in general devices where, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the behavior uh, very much depends on your ability to uh, uh, consume or, or uh, consume less uh, energy uh, so that you know the lifetime of the device uh, can uh, uh, can last longer. So uh, you know reasonably about properties of this kind 
uh, is also quite relevant. So, uh, and, and once you write the properties in this language, uh, you can evaluate these properties by doing, by analyzing the model. And uh, in particular, uh, there is uh, model checkers for uh, uh, um, probabilistic uh, uh, um, models uh, like PRISM uh, and uh, MRMC, PRISM developed by Marta Kiatowska at University of Oxford, MRMC by uh, Katun at Aachen University. And there's, uh, you know, even other uh, tools, but uh, these are, you know, very well engineered tools, very efficient, you know, and, and, uh, and working very well. They're not toy academic tools. I give an example of an application. Suppose that I'm building uh, uh, an application that supports e-commerce. Uh, and in this application, you do login, you search, you know, for example, on Amazon, <laughs> then you buy, you can buy more. Once you finished, you can uh, uh, you proceed to shipping and you can choose between normal shipping and express shipping. And once you do this, you check out and you log out. Okay, that's a typical e-commerce type of uh, uh, behavior. Right, uh, and, and suppose that my requirements say that you have to distinguish in this application between returning customers that you want to treat very well because they are very valuable and new customers. Uh, and, uh, and suppose that uh, you have probabilistic requirements like saying that, well, for example, you know, these are just simple uh, example. The probability of success uh, has to be greater than 0.8. Well, success because, you know, all of these uh, uh, components may fail. Fail mean that uh, 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 at some point you get an error message because, for example, the server that you're invoking is overloaded. And so it drops uh, your uh, requests, okay? Uh, so the probability of success has to be greater than 0, 0.8. The probability of an express shipping failure, so you can be more sophisticated, right? The probability of an express shipping failure for a user who is a returning customer has to be less than this value. The probability of an authentication failure has to be less than this. Suppose you have these requirements, okay? Now, you have to design your system. To design your system, you have to make assumptions. So for example, you have to make assumptions on user profiles. I mean, this is reality. I mean, when you're designing your system, you have to assume how will, what will be the load, the expected load of my system. So for example, what is the probability that the user is a returning customer as opposed to a normal customer? Uh, what is the probability that a, a returning customer chooses to do express shipping, uh, what uh, is the probability that uh, you search again after buying? So what is the probability that after buying you buy again and, or search again? Okay, how do you get those? Rules of thumb, previous systems that you can look at, uh, guess, but the point is, how much you trust this? Well, you know, if you can, of course, you build a system that can adapt. So that if these figures, that is your best uh, choice that you can make at design time, if these figures change, actually your system is able to evolve and uh, ac accordingly. And other, uh, other assumptions, you know, what is the probability that login failure uh, phase uh, why login well i'm assuming that all these things here actually they are external services so login is provided by an authentication service that i integrate in my system i'm not writing the authentication service i rely on a service provided by others uh, normal shipping and express shipping they're done by shipping companies uh, checkout is done by a payment company and i'm using the web service that is uh, exported by these guys and log out the same. So these are uh, 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 external services. Oops. And of course I have to make assumptions. What is the probability that they fail? Because of they drop 
my request because of they are overloaded. Well, the, how do I know that? Well, most likely they are part of the published service level agreement if they are well-behaved services. But how certain am I that the service level agreement is fulfilled uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the service provider? I mean, there is uncertainty here. So uh, this is my best guess, but I have to be open to changes. Now, having made this, this is my design, okay? Uh, my high level, very, very high level model, okay? Uh, what, what it shows is that, you know, I log in, and then I'm logged, then I can be either a returning customer or a new customer, then I can do search, I can do buy, the probability that after search, uh, after buy, I do search again is this, and so on. So this is my uh, 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 DTMC that basically uh, describes both the model of the system and the model of the environment. Because the model of the environment is basically captured by these probabilities that describe, you know, what is the percentage of returning customers over others, those assumptions about the environment. And the rest is the logic of the system that I'm going to buy. So once I have this uh, model, I can run and see, is my model able to satisfy the requirements? So my requirements were these, <coughs> and I can express those properties into my logic, and I can run the model checker, and what I get is that yes, yes, yes. So they are the three properties are satisfied, okay? But now what can happen at runtime? Well, at runtime, what I do is that I monitor the environment, but based on the monitoring, I update, if necessary, my DTMC, my uh, uh, state machine, in particular the probabilities. And I can do this by using some kind of Bayesian approach that you know, estimates the posterior DTMC based on what I observe and the current DTMC. Uh, basically, I can come out with some update formula that I'm not going to discuss here, but, but which basically updates based on what I observe, what is the real failure rate of servers, what is the real percentage of returning customers versus normal customers, I update the model. After I update the model, I redo the model checking. And, and if I do the model checking, uh, you know, by doing model checking, I can predict whether a failure may occur or not in my requirements. And if necessary, I trigger self-adaptation. So let's see in this case. Uh, and let's take this requirement. Now, suppose that I detect that actually this probability is higher in this learning phase that I have at runtime, and I update, and so this is higher. Then it turns out that this requirement is violated. So, and, and notice that this requirement means that, sorry, say it again, that uh, the probability of an express shipping failure for a user recognized as a returning customer is less than this value. Okay, so uh, this probability is, is a failure prediction. It's not necessarily a failure that you experience in the real system. Why? Because uh, you, you do this analysis on the model of the system. Okay, so the model describes all possible future behaviors. So you say that eventually, you know, uh, there will be this violation of this requirement. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in the real running system, the requirement has been violated, okay? So it's a prediction of the requirement. Uh, so the, yeah, uh, forget about this. I, I'm, I'm skipping one thing. So um, now the question is, and I'm actually I was waiting for a comment from uh, uh, Professor Brian saying, well, model checking, it doesn't work, you know? It cannot work in this context, especially if you want to do it at runtime, and he's right. So I, I said, you know, w whenever you do a change, you rerun your model checker, and if there is a violation, then you react. So we have to be able to do this check at runtime in an efficient way. Now, the point is that, so the problem is that 
verification at runtime is subject to hard real-time requirements very often. So the idea is that you want to detect whether there will be a possible violation of the requirements. And before actually the violation occurs, you want to be able to do the change in the system. So the time to detect whether there is a possible violation of the requirements and the implementation of the reaction has to be short enough so that you can do it before the violation actually occurs, right? So that's the real problem. Running a conventional model checking tool after any change is impractical because the model checker is time consuming. It's not a, a very efficient uh, algorithm. Now, the, okay, so that's the point. But, no, the point is that changes are very often local. So the change doesn't mean that you are building a completely different model, right? So the change is localized at certain points in your uh, uh, model, certain transitions, okay? So they do not disrupt the entire uh, 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 specification. So the idea is, can we handle that in some kind of incremental way? So instead of redoing the whole analysis, can we do it better and just adapt you know, to those changes instead of redoing the whole verification? So uh, one of the things that we have done here is what I call incrementality by parameterization. What it means is that, of course, it requires some kind of anticipation from the designer to anticipate the parameters that may change in your model, okay? So typically in a DTMC, it can be the probabilities that you have on certain transitions, the weights, like you know, how much energy you consume. It may be different from what you uh, said before, right? So they, also the rewards, if you take reward DTMC. So, but in general, it's uh, anticipation of changing parameters. So what you can do is then, you build your model in which those parameters, instead of being numbers, they are symbols. They are variables. So you have a model that is partly numeric and partly symbolic. Then you have a condition to verify. So at design time, well, this is something that we do statically, okay? We know what may change, we treat it as symbolic, okay? So the verification condition is then evaluated by what is called a partial or mixed evaluation, in which you have both symbols, variables, and numbers. If you have all numbers, the result is yes or no, if the, uh, the question is a property, or if it is a value, like the probability of reaching a given state is a value. If it is a mixed numeric symbolic uh, uh, um, uh, 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 description, what you have is a formula. So the result is a formula. But it turns out that for reachability, which is the most important property, for, for example, for DTMC, which tells what is the probability of eventually reaching that state? or eventually, con you know, what is the consumption of uh, battery that I have, you know, when I complete my transaction. So the result in this case is a polynomial. Uh, now, evaluation of a polynomial is very efficient. You have a polynomial formula. Evaluation means that you just provide the values for the variables and the values for the variables become available at runtime. But at runtime, instead of doing the model checking, you just evaluate the polynomial formula that gives you the, uh, 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 the uh, 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 condition, uh, the verification condition. And this is very efficient. You know, you can say that evaluating a polynomial is done in constant time. Of course, if the polynomial has three trillions uh, terms, uh, it, it, it's not really, you know, a constant time, but still, you know, it is very efficient compared to the exhaustive search of the state space. So that's, that's the trick. This is uh, actually what has been called by you know, the, uh, the PhD student who did this work, uh, the, uh, the working mom paradigm. Uh, because the working mom, you know, working mom, what does the working mom is to cook first, 
you know, in the evening when the, the children are in bed and, you know, cook everything, put it in the, fridge, in the freezer, and then the next day just warm it up. Uh, and this make it, makes the whole thing, you know, very efficient. And in fact, this is the, 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 the whole story. So you pre-cook your verification at design time where you can spend, as, let's say, as much time as you want. And as I will say, you have to spend a lot of time because this mixed numeric symbolic uh, 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 evaluation is expensive. Uh, but then the warm up is very efficient. So this is an example. Uh, suppose that your property is that the probability of eventually reaching uh, this final state is greater than some given value. Uh, now, this probability can be computed by this polynomial, uh, assuming that these are variable. Of course, it, you say, I don't know how much this is and much this is, but of course, this is 1 minus uh, the 2 and so on. So this is the, uh, uh, if you do this evaluation, uh, you get this polynomial. So this is just an example. So the working mom approach, approach actually assumes that, well, the Markov model contains absorbing state. Well, there's a number of uh, 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 minor assumptions. Uh, uh, um, so states where you eventually end with probability 1, uh, and, uh, and that they, they are reachable. Uh, it works by symbolic numeric uh, matrix manipulation. Actually, it covers all PCTL. I just mentioned uh, uh, reachability, but it covers all the logic. I, I don't have the time. The important thing is that it, is a, it has a very expensive design time partial evaluation, but fast runtime verification, which is confirmed. I don't have the time here to uh, uh, illustrate a number of experimental assessments that we made. Uh, uh, the, uh, the point is that uh, also the design time uh, um, manipulation uh, can be uh, you know, made efficient uh, by, uh, in particular in the case where you have very sparse matrices, which is very often the case, and only few variables. So only few parameters can change, which is the normal case. Of course, if everything can change, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the symbolic uh, uh, evaluation is extremely expensive. Okay, uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, this approach also allows you to do sensitivity analysis. Uh, we build a, a formula that describes the verification for the system. Now you want to say what of the parameters that may change is most important. Which one is most important for uh, uh, satisfying my global requirement? Well, you can do the partial derivative. So you have a formula in x and y, and you want to say between x and y, who is more important? A change in x is more important than a change in y? Well, if you do the partial derivative, uh, it gives you it, it allows you to do this kind of sensitivity analysis. What is, you know, how much uh, the change in X uh, uh, affect uh, your verification as opposed to the change in Y. And, 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 uh, and you can do it for rewards and so on. Now, I really want, uh, you said, I still have some time. Or you want me to, should I switch it off here? Uh, no, you have some hour. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, I want to now go to something that is looking more into the future. So this is what, uh, you know, uh, I think I've learned, I, I didn't say everything, you know, about, you know, these self-adaptive systems. I just, you know, touched on a few things. But, you know, let's see what have we learned from this. So uh, systems can be designed uh, to be self-adaptable, uh, to cover, to cope with uncertainty uh, and uh, with uh, environment changes. They can evolve while they are running. I didn't touch on a, a part of the problem, which is actually how do you, at runtime while the system is running, how do you install the changes in a way that doesn't disrupt the running system, which is another problem that you know, we have been focusing on, which is, of course, an important part of the picture. And if you're interested, uh, I can say more about this. But so we, but. Believe me, you know, there is a way that, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the global method that you can do that as well. And, and what we have learned is that this requires, 
the models to be kept at runtime and verification to check the effects of changes at runtime, plus monitoring and learning from the raw data into uh, you know, the changes into the model. Okay, so this is what we have learned. And in particular, we have observed the fact that there is this fading boundary between runtime and design time. Now, uh, uh, this is what I say, you know, a, a research agenda. I really think that this idea of breaking the boundary between design time and runtime is going to be uh, a way, uh, a practical way for people to develop the systems in the future. Uh, so this uh, break in development time, runtime, has a more general effect that goes beyond uh, the, the case of self-adaptive systems that I have uh, uh, focused on so far. So it, I think it can be a research agenda more generally uh, for people to work on in, in the future. So what I, what I see, what I observe more and more is that we are dealing with what I call perpetual development. Uh, so, you know, we used to think of systems that we design Eventually, we deliver, we install, and then, you know, we have to maintain. That's the whole story. But actually, you know, today, systems flow from design into operation continuously. And they go back continuously. Right? Uh, we see it every day through the network, you know, new pieces of software that are kind of fluids coming out of the pipe and then you know we use them and then they go back and they come back in a different form and so on. So there's this concept of perpetual development. Well to deal with this you know so far people have been uh, proposing you know this idea of being agile you know agile iterative uh, which is okay you know I think it's a actually it's a good idea in, in many cases but it's not enough. So I really think that the traditional separation uh, between development and runtime has to be broken. Now, of course, we want to break it, but at the same time, we have to keep into account that there is this dilemma. So change and flexibility, continuous change, can be adversary to dependability. Okay? So I think that the real challenge for us is to be able to contribute to this continuous, perpetual development, continuous change, but still with a focus on dependability, because we have responsibility for the things that we deliver. So the idea is, can all this be reconciled? Can we you know, deal with this continuous, word of continuous change and evolution? but still develop system for which we can provide assurance, which is the real important thing. Now, my claim is, it's a claim, that models and verification can happily marry both agile development and runtime self-adaptation and eventually lead to what I call a verification-driven life cycle. That's a goal. So you may... Uh, uh, you may argue that you disagree on this. Uh, so what I, uh, and if you want, today what we have, what people have done so far to support this, which is already, I believe, a big enhancement over past practice, is continuous testing or test-driven development. My dream is, can we also add to the picture verification-driven? So. Testing is fine, test-driven development is fine, but uh, you know, I believe that there is a way to even go beyond that and uh, uh, get to what I call verification-driven life cycle of the whole system. Now, to do that, why are we, aren't we there? Okay, let me give you my personal uh, interpretation of this. I believe that, you know, in terms of verification, for example, a lot of progress has been made. So model checking tools, for example, uh, SMT solvers, 
you know, they are great tools that were not available years ago. And they can provide, you know, a, 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 a support to verification that was not possible before. Still, people don't use them. Why? Well, my personal belief is that we have not been able to incorporate them in the right way into the way people work. Testing with test-driven development, with the tools that are available, now practitioners do test-driven development. You know, I see my students, they start when they, uh, they do the, their initial projects, they start using JUnit, you know, and, and integrate testing in their development and continuously do testing. Why not verification? Well, I think that the key feature is the following, that the verification approaches that we have are monolithic. You take the whole system, the whole uh, description, the whole model, and then you run your system. And then eventually, you get an answer. If you change something, rerun the whole thing. So I, I, I really believe that a key feature is to make them agile, incremental, in the same way as we do design. We do design incrementally, we do design iteratively. We should be able to incorporate verification also in the same way, because that's the way people work. So incremental verification, let's see. What, what do I mean by incremental verification? Let's be a little bit more precise. Suppose you have a system or a model and you have a set of properties that are met by the system. Then a change is a new pair. You may change both the specification or the properties or just one of them. So a change is a change in the specification or a change in the, in the properties. Uh, but of course, you know, changes usually are increments. So uh, S prime is, let's say, is S plus delta S. I mean, this is very informal, this plus. I mean, take it as a very informal thing, right? So it's a change, it's a delta, right? Um, uh, so that, that's a change. Now, the, suppose that you have a proof of your system against P. The proof P prime of P prime against S prime should be done by just performing a delta proof. So instead of redoing the proof on the whole system for the new specification, you just do a delta pi. Okay? The, so the expectation is one thing first, that delta pi is easy and efficient to perform as opposed to redoing the whole thing, but also that it gives you insight because it allows you to understand what is the effect of change. By, you know, the delta proof is, is an aid for you to reason about the system and understand what, what does the change mean actually in terms of the properties that you have to satisfy. What is the effect of that change? So, zooming in. Uh, let me give you one first example very quickly and then, uh, I, then I really close. So, uh, Suppose in, in this case, you know, uh, what we want to do is to be able to verify incomplete or evolving specifications. What can be an incomplete specification? Uh, in this particular case, we just took a classical example. You have a, a label transition system, a state machine that specifies the behavior of your system. Okay. So the specification is a label transition system. The, mo uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the model is a label transition system, sorry. The specification, which is the, which is the, the, the properties, that, the property that you want your model to satisfy, in this case, is some kind of uh, uh, um, temporal logic uh, specification. What do I mean by incomplete? and evolving specs. I mean that the model can be incomplete. It, it may be that you know, one state actually hides a behavior that yet I don't know. I will explore later. Okay? So we call these transparent states. So there are states for which I cannot assert anything because either I don't know or it may change 
or I will explore later, which is all things that people do when they design a system. So, for, for example, you, you may leave some parts unexplored at a given point, okay? Now, uh, in, in, uh, in normally, you know, what, what happens is that if when you do verification, you get either yes or no, okay? But now, if your system is incomplete, instead of just having yes, oops, instead of just having yes or no, and in that case, a counterexample, what you can have is that it may tell you maybe. It depends on how you, for example, refine the unknown part, how you will refine the state that you left unspecified. But not only tells you that, it tells you maybe, and this is the constraint that has to be satisfied by that part. Okay? So just to give you an example, uh, this is a label transition system. I like this example. I mean, I didn't produce it. That's a typical uh, PhD student type of slide, right? <laughs> uh, so it means that eventually uh, not a bad guy uh, until uh, the, the fair, okay? So it means that you eventually you get here without going through this bad guy. That's a, uh, a, 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 an LTL, a, 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 it's a temporal logic formula that has to be satisfied by, by this uh, 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 model. And what I'm saying is that, well, this is a part of the system that at this stage uh, is unspecified, or maybe is a part of the system that will change later. Okay, so is this property satisfied? Well, this property uh, is, uh, is satisfied. Uh, if uh, uh, I have this situation, then you know this property, if I take this path, is not satisfied. If I take this part, is not satisfied. Now, if I take this, so the answer would be no in that case. In this case, for this path, it is not satisfied. For this path, it is not satisfied. But, but there is also a possibility uh, for this formula that you go through this path. And in that case, the system tells me, well, if this state satisfies this, then uh, the, uh, the property is satisfied by the whole system. What it means is that you know, w if I change this, I don't have to reevaluate the whole thing. I only have to evaluate the refinement of this with respect to the constraint that I computed. Uh, so, for example, if I refine actually the constraint in this way, then it will be satisfied. Okay, so that's the, uh, well, if I refine in this way, of course, it will not. Now, so the, uh, this approach accommodates incremental development. So I have a part that I haven't, uh, uh, that I was, uh, let's say, design is delayed, I can evaluate I, it, it supports incremental exploration of design alternatives. It supports uh, encapsulation and deferred development. It supports constraint enforcement at runtime. So at runtime, I only have to verify that. Of course, you know, the efficiency of the approach, I, I'm, I don't have time to go into details, but this is just to give you an idea. Uh, well, we have done it, okay. I want to end with something that you know also involves uh, um, Domenico. Um, so the idea is, well, incrementality, incrementality is so important. Can we think of some unifying general approach that can turn any, uh, let's say, verification method into an incremental one? Okay, that's the, the goal. Um, so uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, still collaborating on, uh, on his free time on uh, what we call syntactic, semantic, incremental verification, uh, which, uh, the, you know, the, the, the ambition is to make it, a, to, to develop a general approach that is independent on the artifact. It can be a model, it can be a program that we want to verify. 
it, it is independent of the property language. It can be a, uh, a, a temporal logic or logic, others. Uh, it, uh, it basically, uh, it doesn't constrain the, the possible changes that we make both in the artifacts and in the properties. What is the intuition behind this? Well, the intuition is that uh, w suppose that you have some artifact that is described by some kind of syntax. So all things that we have can be defined by a syntax. Syntax that define either the programming language if we want to verify programs, or it can be the syntax of the model that describes the modeling language. Uh, now, there has been work in the past on incremental syntactic analysis, which basically, given a, an artifact, suppose that you make a change, incremental syntactic analysis is able to rebuild part of the syntax tree that describes the artifact, part of the syntax tree that uh, 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 corresponds to the change that you made and basically hook this part of the tree in the previous syntax tree. I will give you an example in, in the unchanged part. So for example, suppose that you have a very, uh, this is a very simple example, you have this string that re represents this uh, uh, arithmetic expression and, <coughs> and suppose that you change this term to this, okay? Basically this is the syntax tree that describes this one, okay? And this is the subtree that you change when you change this part. And basically, you replace this subtree with this one. Okay? So, if you are able to do this analysis incrementally, basically, given this program and given the change, which is that, you only analyze, you build only this piece of tree that you hook into this part without reanalyzing the part that is unaffected, okay? So this part here of the tree the, is the same as here. This part of the tree is the same as here. The only part that changes is this one, which is replaced by this one, okay? Very intuitively, okay? Suppose that you can do this, and you can do this. So there is ways of doing syntactic analysis Actually, this goes back to some work that I did when I was very young and I had many more hair than I have today. Um, 79 and 1980, that was perhaps you know, my initial um, important type of work that I've done. Anyway, uh, so it goes back to, the, to that time. So there is uh, ways of doing this incrementally. Now the intuition is that uh, you can attach the semantic functions that do the evaluation of this uh, 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 artifact in terms of rules that you attach to the nodes of the syntax tree. So you can use what you know, is uh, known as a formalism that is Knuth's attribute grammars. Well, this formalism, which is attaching these semantic rules to nodes of the tree, okay, to compute functions, is a Turing complete formalism. So you can express whatever function. Uh, and it has been proved that you can always express the computation of those attributes as a bottom-up process. So from the leaves, you compute attributes as, and you move up towards the root of the tree. Okay, so basically the idea is to rephrase all verification algorithms that have to be incremental in terms of attributes of a grammar that describes the syntactic structure of the artifact that you want to be able to evaluate incrementally. Current work, uh, of course, I mean, this is a general idea. You have to show that it actually works. Uh, so one is that we have done uh, uh, this uh, to do uh, 
incremental reliability analysis of web service compositions. So suppose that you have a, uh, uh, the, the thing that you want to verify is a composition of web services and you want to express properties that relate to the reliability of these. And you can do this using this uh, uh, incremental general approach uh, to this case. And uh, another thing that, you know, uh, there is a, one of my current PhD students who is working on this, which is uh, basically express the complete semantics of C. It's almost all of C, okay? And uh, the verification using, you know, matching logic properties. So it's a particular kind of logic that you can analyze incrementally. The point is that there is a tool that is able to do the verification non-incrementally for this language that has been developed uh, by a research group at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And the idea is that we want to exactly use this to compare how an incremental approach works with respect to an approach in which after every change you have to redo the analysis. So since there is a tool for this, which is, you know, to the best of our knowledge, one of the existing good examples of uh, tools that do verification on, on programs uh, for real programming language, so which deals with the heap and everything in, in C, all the dirty things of C, many of the dirty things of C. Uh, and uh, so we're, this is ongoing. And of course, you know, in the end, we would like to be able to have a syntactic semantic incremental engine that we can then use for any thing that you want to make incremental, just code into this formalism. Conclusions? Well, I think I said most of this. Uh, so there's still a long way to go. Uh, and uh, as I said, well, of course, you know, most of this work has been uh, done in the context of the uh, ERC uh, um, project that uh, uh, Lionel Brigham mentioned before. And of course, thanks to uh, you know, many people who have been uh, working on uh, this. Well, they disappeared. <laughs> ah, there's a timer. Oh, no, no, okay. So, uh, so you can also see Domenico there. Uh, okay. <laughs>